Have you ever wondered what it's like to sit in on a magazine editorial meeting? Well, this is your chance. You're listening to Salt Lake Speaks, a monthly podcast where our editors, writers, and staff dig deeper into stories, chat with newsmakers, and talk amongst ourselves about arts, culture, food, music, politics, or whatever else might strike our fancy. After all, we are Utah's biggest fans. Hey Salt Lake, I'm Andrea Peterson, and today on Salt Lake Speaks, we are talking about the ins and outs of creating and experiencing art, who's creating it, where it can be seen, and what it means for Utah's art community. Joining us today is Joy Haynes and Stephen Labram of Three Irons. They like to refer to themselves as a two-person creativity support group. Their goal is to exercise their creative muscles to create, promote, and discover art and culture in Salt Lake City. Guys, thanks for joining us. Hello. Hi, thanks for having us. (laughs) Wonderful. So you guys are currently working on, speaking of being a creative project starter, are working on a major project right now that's like actually a year-long project. Tell us about that. So what we're doing right now is called 50 Irons. We call all of our creative projects Irons, and we have committed to uh, doing 50 creative projects in a span of a year. Wow, that's a lot of art. (laughs) It's a lot. So we started on April 1st. We're a little bit over halfway through, and I think we're on Iron 29. No, we've got 30. 30? Okay, 30 Irons. Wow, that's um, absolutely incredible. So like, what are some of the different types of art that you guys are exploring? Sure. Yeah, and we list all these on our website at 3irons.com, and each one is a separate web page where we take a little moment to blog about the experience of doing each one of these things, but they've been varied things. Uh, We wrote a three-minute comic set, and I performed it at Open Mic Night at Wise Guys Comedy Club. Um, We're hosting a cooking class for culinary arts uh, uh, perspective, and uh, one of the ones, two of the ones we're best known for recently are uh, we commissioned a mural in downtown Salt Lake City uh, by an artist named Vexta, and we also uh, produced an event at Sky SLC for the musicians of the Utah Symphony with the visiting artists that they had. So, so da- really just dabbling all over in all pieces of art, <laughs> basically. If it, if it falls under art and culture, then we are usually willing to experiment with it. So this is actually a perfect segue. So for both of you, I wanted to get, what is your definition of art? I know that's a tough one and it's big and explorative, but we got to ask it. What do you guys think? Oh man. I think uh, for me, uh, art is the creative expression of intelligence and inspiration. Whenever, uh, for me, my art is taking uh, an imagination, a, uh, an idea, and making it happen. So I would also include entrepreneurism as art. Uh, seeing a, a business opportunity and figuring out how to pull the resources together to make it happen, to express something new, to take pieces and make something new. So the creative part process is really art for me because it, you can be classified as a visual artist or a musical artist or a, there are these other niches of art, but art in itself is art. It comes from the term artificial. There's something new, something that didn't exist before. And, and I think for us, as we're looking at these different 50 irons, as you mentioned, they're varied. And they're varied on purpose. We don't really want to do the same thing twice uh, because we're trying to explore that creative potential of just doing all these different things. We're, we have another project coming up where we're going to do glass blowing, and, mm. and we're, we're dabbling in lots of different areas, but all of them have this common thread of the discipline of creativity and, and allowing that inspiration to take form. I really like that, the dis- discipline of creativity, because you're right, that is definitely something for business. But what about yeah. you, Joy? Um, well, that's interesting because, you know, art, I feel like, is is uh, in the uh, eye of the beholder. And so I think it can be in uh, and of the maker. So it doesn't have to be tangible, it can be. And I, and I totally agree that it can be um, like in the form of business. I think that producing, there's an art to producing. Um, and then you know, there's the kind of art that we're accustomed to, which the visual art or going to the theater or something like that, playing an instrument. But um, you know, I think it's really open to interpretation, and that's part of what we have been doing this year. Is some, there's been things we want to do, and we have to say, well, wait a minute, is that art? And then we have to have a conversation to figure out whether it is or not, and if it falls falls you know within our mission statement. So I mean, a lot of people do use that term, eye of the beholder, but kind of, but at the same time, do you think there's something to be said about good or bad art? I mean, we have curators for a reason. And they're not just simply saying we're going to curate a bunch of French art pieces or, or films. There's something to be said. They have to make a selection process. So what do you think about that good versus bad art? <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, Christy Marcy, who is with Salt Lake Magazine uh, and is a music critic, actually said something once that really resonated with me. She often will listen to music that she doesn't necessarily like 
but she'll critique that art based that art form of music based on whether or not they accomplish what they set out to do as a way of critiquing art and certainly a curator is trying to accomplish a particular mission they're saying this art space needs to have a particular form of art what is my vision for what should be accomplished and I think a good curator um, knows how to find those correct pieces of art that will fulfill that purpose and whether or not everyone agrees with that is, is, is it, if everyone agrees with it it's boring it's mm -hmm. not going to be something that's interesting at all it should have people that are detractors and should have people that embrace it and should have people that are inspired by it and, um, and also you're just never going to please everyone I mean we can all three of us have a different opinion here about a piece of art whether we like it or whether we think it's quote good or quote bad and I just want to give one quick plug here to Umoka has a fantastic class that they offer called Art Fitness for people to basically learn how to evaluate art um, without uh, preconceived judgment, like stepping into it or, 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 and or being able to step beyond being able to just say, I like it or I don't like it, but mm. to figure out why. And I took that class and it was, I really just changed the way that I view art. I think it's a it's a, just an afternoon and it's a couple hours. It's a really cool, fun class. I think it's really important to the human experience that we learn how to both determine whether we like or don't like something, but we also learn how to answer that question, why do I like it or I don't like it? I think it's very easy for us to just, it, it, I think we deprive ourselves of an opportunity to understand what might be behind somebody else's work if all we do is we look at it and say, I don't like that. If we can say, I don't like that because I don't appreciate how they only used colors that were off the shelf and they didn't mix anything new and it seemed like it didn't really require that much skill or whatever, then I think we've allowed ourselves to start to look at the world around us in a new way, which is a really important role of art. I think it helps us to become more critical thinkers, more, more thoughtful participants in society and in life's experiences. And, and it certainly helps me to feel like my life is richer. So speaking of, most of the art that we're talking about is like going to a museum or going to a film or to a play, and so you kind of know what you're getting into, you're paying for the art that you're going to receive. But how does that pertain, I mean you guys just did a giant mural outside the Impact Hut building, so how does that pertain do you think to like public art, where someone is, um, doesn't actually get to participate in um, or choose through money, like a financial means, to watch or receive some art, but instead have, I guess the word have to look at it regardless. How do you think that works in who gets a say and who gets to receive, and mm. how they receive There's public art? There's also the flip side of that, is yeah. all the people who, that, that maybe wouldn't pay or can't pay to see art get to see it. That's right. a very good point. Yes, and I, and I think that there's, uh, the challenge with public art is often that you'll, especially when it's in a public place that's owned or funded by a public entity, uh, it's often up to a committee to try and decide what deserves to be in that space, trying to answer some of those questions. Is this representing something we want represented? Is this going to stand the test of time? Is it going to be interesting? Um, I have found in my, personally, that and particularly for our art project, we had a very limited group of two people. And in fact, we didn't even tell the, this artist what she had to paint. We looked at, at her history of what she had painted and found that she was someone that could handle something of this magnitude and that we liked her art and thought, this is different, this is unique to the Utah artscape, so let's, let's go for it. Let's give her the opportunity to make whatever she wants to make on this wall and give her the means to do it. And I think that that is an important part of the art experience uh, with public art. It, it, if we, you can over curate what's going up in public spaces and create bland, meaningless uh, things. Uh, it, if you're walking through a city that is filled with beautiful, it was filled with uh, an abundance of public art, you should absolutely find things you hate and find mm -hmm. things you like, find things that surprise you. Otherwise, it would be like the most boring museum in the world. Come to the Museum of Mediocrity, where everything you see is going to fit within your view of the world, and, and you'll understand all of it, and you'll leave not even remembering what you saw. And so I, I'm hopeful, particularly for Salt Lake, and what, a mark that we're trying to make in Salt Lake is to be a part of more public art going up, because it is accessible, it is something that catches people's eyes. You don't have to walk through a turnstile and pay a fee to see it. And we're hopeful that more and more of this goes up because I think it is uh, something that visitors to Salt Lake City, it becomes more of a destination, things to do and see when you're there. 
And, uh, and for example, with uh, the owl that we put up, if people love it, great, they've seen it, maybe they want to get involved in the next project. If they hate it, great, maybe they want to like make their get own. Get involved in the next and, project. And do <laughs> something else to like overshadow what's been done. And so either way, it's m more conversations happening, more things are happening. I love that, the idea that art creates conversation, and I think that's a huge thing. Um, we did an episode with Cynthia Fleming of Salt Lake Acting Company, and we were talking about that, because we were talking about censorship in theater, and you know, what is theater, and it was like it's a place to create discussion, and I think a lot of art is to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but talking about the mural, so like, you guys have multiple art pieces, how do you guys select, our, I mean, Vex is obviously an Australian artist, so she's not local. Um, how do you guys decide who to get involved with and why not a local artist or something like that? Well, we've done lots of things with local okay. artists. I mean, we've done Iron 30 and I think they've all been with local people except for this particular one. So, um, you know, this, this one in particular, we looked outside of Salt Lake because we needed, we, well, for a couple of reasons. One is um, that that's the nature of evolution, is we need to cross-pollinate. And um, we also don't think that our local artists shouldn't be able to work elsewhere, so there's no reason why other artists can't work here. Um, we needed someone who was going to do something different that hadn't been done here in Salt Lake. And we also needed someone who knew how to operate a 125-foot boom. <laughs> okay, on a five-story yeah. building that was 200 feet wide that went over two different buildings next to it over their roofs. So um, we couldn't have someone who had never done a wall of that size before. That's, so it's kind of limiting. I mean, there's not that many of them out there. And so she is Australian. She happens to live in... The United States. She lives in Brooklyn. She's on an O1 Extraordinary Ability Artist Visa, so she's yeah. a you know world renowned. I mean, it's like a pretty awesome piece of art to have here in Salt Lake. I mean, it, this is the kind of art that people go out of their way to see, and it brings people downtown, brings people to the city. Um, it's a it's a tourism. I like that idea where you say cross pollination because mm -hmm. I mean there is a huge trend right now for local everything local food, local art, local this, local that, and to some extent that is brilliant and that is great, but like you said, um, it is wonderful to be able to see outside of the state and to have our, our artists mm -hmm. or whoever to be seen outside yeah. of the state as well. And I think that's an interesting thing that leads me to my next question. Do you see if that Utah has maybe a different taste and acceptance of visual art than other cities? Because for instance, um, the Mormons historically have been very involved in dance, stage, and music, but often become weary of like visual art or performance art because it might be too edgy or subversive um, or, or questions the status quo. And Umoka um, is struggling a little bit more than the UMFA because it has an emphasis on paintings and landscapes and old art and all that kind of stuff. So uh, what have you guys seen working with not only Utah artists but seeing the reactions in the community of art? Yeah, I've, I've seen it be nothing but positive so far. I think that what Utah struggles with more than maybe an acceptance or non-acceptance of visual arts is, uh, and, and I'm on the board of Umoka, so for full disclosure, I'm involved in these conversations <laughs> a lot, uh, is, is how do we make art that's challenging accessible? Uh, and, and that is a constant challenge. Uh, when you go to UMFA and you're seeing a landscape or you're seeing the classics and the masters, you know what you're going to get. When you're going to the Utah Symphony and hearing the classics and the masters, you know what you're signing up for. Um, and whenever someone pushes those boundaries a little bit, uh, there's discomfort. And, and I think that it's uh, incumbent upon the arts organizations to make that new art accessible for those who are looking to cross over. And you have to do that by, 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 by having welcoming arms and by, and, and by helping through whether it be the class that Joy talked about, about uh, uh, the art, art fitness. fitness class, um, or whether it be in theater and, and finding ways to open those doors to new communities is really the challenge. And, and it will always be a challenge if the dominant money players in a community are putting their money, where they're putting their money behind. The, the symphony, uh, although it's had its troubles in the past, is very well funded by the local money and philanthropy. And so I think some of these more challenging art forms will have the opportunity to have their voice heard more as, as some of the traditional money sources do. Uh, uh, support those art forms so that they can do the marketing and sell their story. Because ultimately, once somebody walks into Yumoka, they may feel challenged. I was challenged when I first walked in there. I saw like a pile of candy in the corner and I just thought, what the heck is this? And I felt dumb. 
And luckily, I fell into that class, that art fitness class, I did, and, and that because I wanted to understand, like, why did someone think a pile of candy in the corner was important? Um, but never, it, and we have to find ways to help answer those questions. And, and I think uh, visual arts often becomes more challenging in that way. Well, it makes me wonder, because we often, you know, you hear things described or referred to even when they're just developing opinions for art lowbrow versus highbrow, sophisticated versus not. Why, if we simply say, we, I feel like we contradict ourselves when we say, I have the beholder, and then we say, well, you know, the sophistication of understanding like a Monet painting or a Mozart symphony, and does it have some, do we, do you think critics out there, or even just us in the art, communica art community, are kind of hindering experiencing and creating with that well, concept. So we just did this MODIS event, right? Mm -hmm. Musicians of the Utah Symphony at Sky. And, and the mission of MODIS uh, after dark, Musicians of the Utah Symphony after dark, is a group of musicians from the symphony that play in unexpected venues. Um, their mission is to bring uh, symphonic music to, I guess, underexposed audiences is one way to put it. But also, it, it I see it as bringing it to people who are intimidated by the symphony or think they don't like the symphony or think it's too expensive to go to the symphony. Um, and so when we bring it to a place like Sky where, you know, it's this, it's kind of like two worlds colliding where it's people that would never normally go to the symphony for any one of those above reasons now gets exposed to it. And so that's, and I, and, and, and I think if we don't make the effort to bring it to the masses, I guess, is one way to put it. Just same thing with like bringing the mural out to the public. Then, you know, some people who don't walk through the doors and pay and go through the turnstile are never going to get exposed to this kind of art. I think it's a big challenge for the art community, too, to realize that we're sitting around talking about art all the time, but not everyone has that that same level. I mean, everyone's at some different level, and, it, and it's very easy for us to talk highbrow and sophisticated and belittle those who may not have had the chance yet to learn or appreciate something that we love. Um, and a, a great teacher of mine once said, you can't teach anything by pointing at someone. You've got to stand by their side and, and, and help them to see the way that, uh, so they can find it for themselves. And so again, I think that's the challenge for art. We can either make mediocre art, frankly, that's easy for everyone to understand, or we can take a chance and invest the time to help people to see something in a new light. But that's going to require us to meet them where they're at and say, hey, take a peek at this. What do you think? How does it make you feel? And be willing to accept that their interpretations might not be the same as our, inter our interpretations. <laughs> no, and that makes sense. Like, I think there is some bit of education that does help, like with art, because art, I mean, in a cliche, has been expressed as multiple different languages in and of itself. And if you don't know a language, you don't understand what you're supposed to be experiencing or receiving or how to take it in. And I do, I totally agree, like, you know, with the symphony, there are pieces of works that you're like, okay, they're playing music, but if you start learning what the story's behind them, or the mm -hmm. composer, or why there's created, or there's an intention, because there is no words, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you're hearing things differently, and when the tuba is doing such and such, <laughs> it's this old man heading over the heel to his death, or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, and that definitely changes how you take it in. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, talking a little bit about those who sit there and want a lowbrow or highbrow art, um, art critics. And I've actually, I mean, probably a lot of everybody out there, our listeners, have seen the movie Birdman. And there's a scene in there that just blows my mind, and I'm like, this is so true. And basically, um, Birdman, Michael Keaton's character, is speaking with the stage critic at the bar. And she's, you know, throwing her weight and her ability to basically write a review, and it has the ability to close his play. Um, she even says, she's quoted as, I'm going to turn in the worst review anybody has ever read and I'm going to close your play. And then Michael Keaton brings up the point that she is destroying the very thing that feeds her. <laughs> um, and then he also makes a good point that in the end, all of this costs her nothing. But as an actor, a director, a playwright, or whatever, the play costs him everything. So by simply writing a review, a skating review, or a good review, or whatever, um, they have so much power over an artist's work. And it just makes me sit there and think that sometimes um, how having a difference of opinion versus maybe being insulting, you know, like how art is received and Criti criticized, good or yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah, that's such an interesting thing because we, you know, as Three Irons, we see a and consume a lot of art in this town, and we tweet about it. We put on Instagram, Facebook, um, and and 
there's a bit of a struggle, especially I think in a small town where you do, don't want to shut anybody down and you, there's something to be said for anybody that's willing to put themselves out there in an artistic way and to spend the time and all the rehearsal or practice or money or whatever it took to like get that piece of art up and out there is a lot more than any critic has done who's sitting there reviewing it. So, um, and, but in a town this small, I think it is a little bit hard because you actually like end up knowing each other and, and you need to, but you need to maintain your credibility also. So like if Three Irons, we have opinions about things and if we, if we, we have to remain true to those while still not denigrating work that perhaps just we don't enjoy for whatever reason, or maybe I don't and Stephen does or vice versa, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we still have to be honest. I think there's a way to be honest without being mean. Correct. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to kind of explore. I think sometimes it's easier for people to take art and make it personal and then mm -hmm. write their article or review just like this reviewer in Birdman was. She mm -hmm. just didn't mm -hmm. like Michael Keaton's character, and so it didn't matter mm -hmm. if it was good or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think particularly in a day and age of on anonymity on the Internet, and people will be willing to post anything that they want, and it's often more fun to post something that's that's eye-catching and, 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 and denigrating to someone's work. On the same token, I have not spoken to a major arts leader in this town who doesn't lament that we don't have a more established art criticism mm -hmm. industry in this town. Um, art criticism has the opportunity uh, to elevate the quality of art that, that is put out because uh, mediocre art can and is produced every day in this town. And if there's no art criticism, we're all just sitting around saying, hey, nice job, everybody gets a participation medal for, for, for trying, then we don't elevate the expectation for excellence. And uh, I don't care if it's art or business or whatever it might be, uh, criticism has its role. Um, and uh, going back to Marcy's point, I think that a, a skilled art critic knows that fine line between, between putting something that's an eye-catching headline uh, which will help viewers to want to read because they're also challenged with the idea of if I just put in a, a fluffy little article, no one's going to read it. And so they have to p put catchy headlines. They have to have well-written words that are that people will enjoy reading. But in the same token, they I think uh, I appreciate and hope that there is more art criticism in this town that that addresses that idea of what were they trying to accomplish? Did they? How did I feel about it personally? How do I think you, the viewers, will think about it personally? Because those are all four different questions. And if it's all just how I feel about it personally, that's just an opinion piece. Mm -hmm. If it's all how you might feel about it, and, or a summary, there's so many summary reviews mm -hmm. in this town. And they're worthless. What's a summary review say? You can get a summary off the, the website. The notes, right? uh, th those are, <laughs> and, and that's like 80% of what we see. F and it's, and it, it's the guise of art. Uh, 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 journalism. But unfortunately, at the same time, I think our newsrooms are struggling to monetize, paying someone a salary to spend full time writing art. So, I, so I'm hopeful for the future of art in Utah that we are able to more develop that, that skill and that the mm -hmm. Salt Lake Tribune and the Deseret News, who I think do the best that they can, uh, have more resources and involvement in, in creating the standards for that. I'm not quite sure what that, that becomes. Maybe it's uh, awards for, for our criticism <laughs> or, or something like that, but it, it certainly needs to be uh, uh, evolved in this town. I, I think there's room to grow. So kind of jumping off that, so like reviewers have so much control over the success of a show, whether it's an art show, a play, a film, or whatever. Um, that kind of heads towards the business of art, because mm. some would argue art for the sake of art. But then an artist needs to be fed and there needs to be a monetary value attached to their work. So say going to a film or play or an orchestra, I mean, many of America's orchestras have gone bankrupt or on strike over the past couple years. And it's not just the small ones, it's like Minnesota, Atlanta and Pittsburgh. I mean, that was a big one. Um, or you've got some theater companies like community theaters that don't pay or some that have small stipend and then some that actually uh, pay a fuller actual salary, does someone getting paid define the worthiness or greatness of their art? Like who is getting to say how much someone's art should or should not cost? Does that change where it places, you know, where people place value on it? Wow, that sounds like a great topic for next month's <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. There's so much in that one. That, that one's <laughs> tough to unpack. Uh, I will say 
as you were talking, the one idea that was popping in my mind was, regardless of whether an art critic is saying so or not, I think the market begins to decide the value of some of these things. And we can all pretend like our cousin's art is really great and we will all come out and spend a few bucks on it. But the reality is it won't stand the test of time unless it truly is great. And, and I think that critics can have power to help to launch the same way that gallery owners, by selecting those people, will have the opportunity to do that. Same way that luck and having your piece picked up by some celebrity that then posts right. a picture with them. I mean, there's so many elements to what can build someone's career. Um, for, for me personally, uh, and, and Joy, I think you can speak to this as, as, as an actor as well. There's, I think if you love your art, you're, you're going to continue to create so much quantity and, and hope for those opportunities of luck and hope for those, those choice encounters with the right critic or the right people. It isn't just going to be one criticism on one opportunity. Anyone who believes that there's like this silver bullet to starting a business or mm -hmm. building your art career doesn't know that you spend your entire life engaged in that process. I mean, I, I started seven companies until I finally had a company that made a profit. And if I'd given up after the first one or felt bad about the second one or didn't stand up to the criticism of the third one, I never would have made it to the seventh one. And so I, I think that there's more about the discipline of your art and the fact that you just can't mm -hmm. not do it that pushes you through to that moment that hopefully the stars align to, to help you to feed your family too. Yeah. Well, what do you see yeah. as an actor? Well, doing? I mean, uh, you know, actually, so this is my 30 year anniversary of having my union card, actually. Wow. <laughs> Just realized Congratulations. that. Congratulations. And this month, too. It's October. Wow. Yeah. Happy um, anniversary. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, and believe, so talk about persistence and, you know, ups and downs, and 95% of my 30 year career has been rejections, you know? Um, but one thing as, as artists, I think we're constantly. Um, asked to work for free and that happens a lot and I think there's some times when that's just perfectly okay and it makes sense um, but then there's times when it's not and you know it just you just can analogize it easily to you know maybe somebody's starting a coffee shop and you know you just think oh well can I just have some of your coffee for free you know it's like, no. <laughs> so um, you know I, I, th I think that's what I think we can't say that because somebody makes money or because they make this much money that they're a better artist than somebody else. Some people aren't interested in making money, frankly. You know, they just want to produce art. And some people, all they're interested in is making money. And so they, you know, create a, a, their, the product out of themselves. Is I don't know, is that art? Maybe it is. Yes, it, you know, it's, so I, that's, I think it's sort of an obvious answer that no, of course, like whatever somebody's paid doesn't make, make an artist, but um, you know, that's, that's just, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of this discussion about that spectrum. <laughs> No, that's yeah, a good and point. And I think it's a critic's job to be a good critic. I don't think that they can make their decision on whether or not they're doing the right thing for that artist. That's not their responsibility. Their responsibility is to write good criticism. And because they, they that also just gives that critic way too much power. I mean, certainly the New York Times reviewers have a great deal of power. I read the New York Times theater reviews when I make a decision about what I'm going to see. Um, uh, but ultimately, uh, I think it's that... It, that individual's persistence in being creative that will stand the test of time. Yeah. Well, um, just to wrap us up, um, where do you see the future of art in Utah? Where are we headed? Where? What have you seen? Where do you think we're heading? Things in Utah matter differently than they do in other places. It's one of the things that I love about being in Salt Lake City. Uh, our, our gay pride parade means something different than every other gay pride mm -hmm. parade in the United mm -hmm. States. Our expressions of art, having this Saudi Arabian uh, exhibit up at, at, at Umoka right now, they're doing that uh, exhibit similar to that in 10 cities in the United States. But the one in Salt Lake means something. It's, it, our community is a unique community in the world. And so our art and the way that we learn to express ourselves is also unique. So where I see the future of our art is, is we become a more inclusive and developed and connected society. The voices from Salt Lake City and the, and the things that we're creating here um, will continue to have a unique perspective by those who are consuming it both locally and on the international stage. I also think we're getting a lot more money here from Silicon Slopes to just the amazing growth that we have in Salt Lake means that there's going to be more money to be invested in the art. And I think the big challenge for the arts community is to figure out how to access that. Uh, it, we need to access new donors. It can't be the same 10 names that are backing everything that happens in this town. 
Um, and shout out to the companies out there that call, that call themselves part of Silicon Soap. So we need to be engaged with you. You guys will be the ones who are the future of what the art is in Salt Lake City, not the, the same families that have supported it and carried it for the last 50 yeah. years. And especially if they want to continue you know, increasing and diversifying their own workforce, those people are going to demand art yeah. and culture. Well, thank you, Stephen and Joy, for joining me. Um, you guys can find more about Three Irons and their 50 Irons project at their website, which is... Threeirons.com, the number three, irons.com. And you can find them on Facebook, Twitter, and is Instagram as well for Three Irons SLC. Am I yeah. correct? Yep, Three Irons SLC. Wonderful. Well, thanks, for guys, for having us. And for all of you out there, I'm Andrea Peterson, and you can find this episode as well as others at saltlakemagazine.com slash podcast.